<laughs> hey, welcome. Thank you guys all for joining us today at the Madison Power BI User Group. We are going to be talking about what does it take to unlock a successful business intelligence and data platform. Excited to have you all here in the room. Excited to have you online. I've got great news for those of you in the room. We have actual Microsoft legitimate fabric swag in, in the room. So throughout the course of the night, unfortunately, it doesn't apply to anyone on the live stream here. Uh, we will be asking questions about Microsoft Fabric, Microsoft Power BI, those types of things. People who can answer them will uh, be able to get, I think, what is that? Is that a uh, fabric hoodie? One of the official fabric hoodies? Oh, how nice. Oh, 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 oh I'm exceedingly jealous. I hope I can answer one of the questions. Um, but for those of you who are on the live stream, please, if you have questions for the group, uh, enter it into the chat with a key colon. We'll get those queued up and we'll ask that. But primarily, this is going to be a conversation that we're going to be holding here um, in person. So if you guys have questions about uh, any of the things that we're talking about tonight, please go ahead and, and ask them. This is not a video recording. Uh, Scott is exceedingly good at this topic. So uh, with that, I am going to turn things over to Scott. There we go. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, great to see some familiar faces. Happy New Year. We're finally back from all the holidays. Hopefully, everyone had a great time. Um, and sorry we canceled. I think canceled the December one, but we're back full force 2024. Let's go. All right. So there's your welcome introduction. We'll get to our main presentation here. Um, really, I, I asked for some help uh, tonight. So Definitely, I'll, I'll kick things off and I'd like to talk about data strategy and program execution and kind of what we do from a Baker Tilly consulting standpoint um, to help our clients succeed with data and get on with their data and analytics projects, um, kind of what that approach looks like from our standpoint. Um, and then, because and I think that feeds it really nicely into, hey, now that you've got the, the strategy and the plan, let's kick it over to Elliot Pack on our team and he'll talk through some of the reporting design process. We try to approach and utilize and like uh, you know, keep those techniques up as we kind of approach new projects with clients. Um, and then also uh, a newer member on our team this past year, Braden Gogan. Uh, Braden's on one of my one of our long-term projects with a client. Uh, he's with his background. I like I really wanted him to kind of share his journey from college for internship in college and joining our Baker Tilly team as a business analyst role, and but really going deep into um, some of the Azure side, uh, those services, and then obviously getting into Power BI very heavily. He earned his certification in Power BI recently. I, I thought it would be great for him to kind of share his journey, kind of talk about the PL300 if you guys haven't taken that yet, um, as, as well as we know there's a Fabric certification that's out. Uh, that's available now too. So the TP 600. There we go. Well, we got a few people on our team that are looking, um, studying right now, and looking ahead to to getting that. So there you go. So I'll try not to talk the whole time, but I'll um, I'll give you my my two cents, and then kind of kick it over to these guys and make sure uh, we get a, a good, well-rounded conversation. Again, uh, feel free to you know raise your hand, pause, uh, you know, let, ask any questions. Throughout, we want this to be interactive. Hopefully, we get some T-shirts thrown, thrown over the. Uh, try not to knock over any any drinks or anything. Yeah. Cool. All right. So yes, Chris, uh, thank you for the great intro online, um, unlocking business, you know, success, and you know, really, how do we, uh, how do I, how have I kind of approached um, data and analytics projects over the years? Um, I'll talk through a little bit of my background and then. Um, uh, kind of share with you like some of our proven approach and strategy of having our clients think about data strategies to from the get-go um, so that you know people aren't just creating Power BI PBIX files and saying is this good there you go <laughs> right so we know that rarely works rarely get it perfect the first time so having a strategy is a great thing and so just uh, we, we do this internally at Baker Tilly so one I'm sorry I'll back up so Chris, myself, Marcus, um, 
Elliot and Brandon on the call. We all work for Baker Tilly Digital. Uh, we're consultants, so we help our clients su succeed with data and, and do better with it, do, do good things with their data so we can, uh, so they can make better decisions and uh, be confident about the, the moves that they want to make in the marketplace to stay competitive, what have you. So we're happy to like be able to share some of our um, expertise or thoughts and pers perspectives tonight. Um, cool. Yeah, so I guess this is me. This is something we do internally um, in our practice. We're going to reuse some of these slides here. So a little bit about me. I know I'm a senior manager with Baker Tilly. I've um, been here since 2019, been in consulting for, I don't know, well over 15 years or so. Um, married, I live in Verona, just, you know, outside Madison here, a couple of kids, both middle schoolers. So I'm uh, in the throes of, oh, that's right, General. Um, and we've got our nice dog, Sophie, who uh, I have to, she keeps me exercising because I have to take her for walks even in zero degree weather. Professional skills, so I have a big background in data strategy, helping clients figure that out, get a plan before they go off and create. Um, I love data modeling, so star schemas, dimensional modeling, data vaults, whatever the case is to, to help unearth your data, shape it for, for end user, business user analysis and consumption. Um, data visualization, of course. Uh, cool, hang on a second, Scott. Yeah. Time for the first question. Scott brought up a great uh, topic here. Who here can tell me the difference between a fact and a dimensional table? Fact table is going to contain like transactional data. It's going to have like the numbers associated with an event. Dimensions are going to describe the uh, entities on that event. Well done. All right. Medium, large, what size do you want? Large. <laughs> and, uh, as our, our first question answer, we also have one phone in. There we go. Woo! All right. Pretty interrupt. You're just no, you got it. That was perfect. Kind of like those, <laughs> those polls and teams meetings or Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for the poll here, you get no credit. So, um, yeah, even at, even my, at uh, my middle age here, I'm playing indoor soccer again with the old guys. I'm trying not to get hurt, so I'm definitely um, having fun in, in my uh, kind of adulthood, um, fatherhood here, and I get to do, you know, fun stuff uh, every day with the guys I work with, with the people I work with, um, to try to make sense of data and, and help our customers. I get up every morning and excited to go to work, which is great. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, you know, as always, with, with new things that are coming out and new capabilities and AI this and co-pilot that we're we're trying to stay on top of how do we leverage those types of new capabilities uh, so our clients can leverage those in a secure but uh, meaningful manner so um, try to push analytics maturity ahead for all of our clients so it's exciting for us and, and nerve-wracking as well as uh, things are moving really fast all right uh, anyone a water skier sorry i got i got some water skiing background so all right Awesome. All right, good. Trying to get my kids into it. They're, they're not great takers at it yet. They, they want a tube still. All right, so I'll take a few minutes here. I want to, and I'll try to breeze through things so we don't take up all the time. I'll keep keep tabs on things. So when, you know, Big Utility Digital, our approach to data strategy and program execution, and this is a nice kind of diagram, if you will. So. And truly, I'll, I'll point out the steps or kind of the deliverables that we and the activities that we do in each of these things here in a minute. What I really want to do is I'll explain some of the steps here, but then I'm going to actually show you some of the deliverables or examples and samples of the deliverables that we'd actually uh, create and craft and, and hand over to our clients to help them then take, you know, take that to the next level and go, go ahead and build, and implement and utilize Fabric and, and Power BI and Azure and what have you. Uh, first step, right, is, uh, so, one, I guess I'll ask, anyone have, has anyone gone through a data strategy kind of um, initiative before? Awesome, Aaron, all right, I'd give that man a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, would you like? And, uh, you know, I think what, you know, one thing that we've done with some of our clients, too, is it's not just a once and done activity uh, to go through these data data strategy assessments. We'll actually uh, talk about 
know, doing data strategy refresh or whatever you want to call it, 2.0. Because obviously, as we all know, after a couple of years, maybe business questions have changed because the, the business model has maybe been tweaked. Um, I'm sure Milwaukee Tool and others right in the room here have been, um, you know, been having to been deal with like outside things right around COVID and and differing um, yeah, behavior, sorry, customer behavior, uh, um, choices and things like that. And so you're adapting, you're trying to be resilient. And so you gotta be um, still strong in the, strongly competitive in the market. So I guess the first step I, that we do here is this discovery and prioritization. What that really means is we're going to do stakeholder interviews and um, literally get in the room, get in the conference room or get on some calls here uh, video calls and we'll go around and, and actually talk to all the different business areas in, within your company who want to participate in this data strategy initiative. Hopefully that's all of them, if you will. So literally we've done these before and I've, we've had, you know, a grueling three days of, of meetings set up because we're, we're interviewing stakeholders like leaders, managers, directors, and, and C-levels in uh, different business areas. Um, grabbing, grabbing those notes and those thoughts and those great conversations and try to then later on distill those down. We'll get into that in a second. Chris. So why do you talk to all the business? It's a great question. Because um, usually, you know, we don't want to just give the uh, analytics to the one squeaky wheel uh, business area. You know, everyone can leverage it, right? So um, to get a holistic, uh, you know, holistic picture of what an organization, organization's true uh, organizational goals, if you will, um, we, we have to look at all different angles, not just sales, right, or not just finance and HR. Uh, so, you know, look at all the manufacturing, look at, you know, if you're making, if you're making something, you're distributing something or supply chain, right? A lot of those factors go into ultimately how well a company or organization is going to perform. You know, are you making money or are you saving money, right? Um, are you keeping your employees happy? Are you keeping your, are you uh, gaining market share out there with customers? So, we know in a business, right, you know, data aside, all those things have to come into play. And so we want to talk to everyone because everyone uses data, as we know. So what are the metrics? Um, how, do, you know, how do you know if you're doing a good job at you know, leading your department? What are, the, what are those metrics? What are those KPIs? So we want to uncover all those business questions, uncover those metrics, and get them written down. Some of them are known. Some of them are not known. Um, as well as, like, some departments out there maybe have never gotten a fair shake at working with IT and getting their priorities um, you know, up to the top of the list yeah, it's a few things. So we'd like to hear from everyone and get it all out on the table. Awesome. So um, from there, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into a building a business dimensional model. Has anyone ever, or kind of loading data in the Power Query or what have you, and, you know, build out that dimensional model on paper, if you will, or Excel or whatever the, whatever the tool you have? Awesome. So just like we talked about facts and dimensions, um, you know, we're steeped in, in Kimball, meth, you know, uh, dimensional modeling. I actually went to New York a while, uh, some years ago and got to um, work with Marty Ross and get taught by her and really stretched my mind on not just reading the Kimball book, but actually, okay, living and breathing it in some exercises in a room in a conference room on, by Times Square. And uh, so, yeah, it, this stuff is hard at times, right? So it's not just, uh, you know, sales and customers and dates. Um, you really got to think about that process and then laying it out. So seeing where, where your conformed dimensions are going to exist and where those intersections are between your facts and dims. So laying that out is, is a great thing. Um, of course, the fun stuff then gets to solution, the solution concept. So this is probably where everyone dives right into the solution concept, probably before a conversation one with maybe a consultancy that wants to, uh, that's here to help you guys. Everyone's like, all right, I need Power BI, let's go. Okay, but what, let's, let's talk about that a little bit here first, right? So we know there's a um, whole set of architecture around, around ingestion and ETL and ELT and storing your data and um, proliferating your data out to the consumption layer. How are you going to do that? Do you need data stores? Do you need different data models? Do you need Power BI Premium? Do you need Fabric? So there's a whole lot of different um, options there. And so we try to use, utilize like what we're hearing from the customers um, distill down their current state, um, understand their, their future state vision, um, and then come up with a solution concept. And that's like architecture, right? It could be tools and technologies um, that hopefully match the capabilities that they don't have today and that they need 
for the future. It's not it's not always just one size fits all. We're like, hey, here's the thing, go go off and do it, right? So we're, we may plug and play different components into our architecture based on their needs. Um, and then obviously the fun stuff is put the right team in place. We have we have customers who are you know, different levels of maturity around building out their analytics team. They may not even have an analytics department, right? So they just do IT and, um, and that's totally fine, right? So um, as they grow or as their business needs grow, then they may need to start, you know, we try to recommend, hey, carving out a actual dedicated analytics team, um, data engineers, architects, business analysts, right? To interface with the business stakeholders so we can get those requirements built out and stories written. Um, and so you can start to crank out that work and deliver things um, iteratively. Uh, that's not easy. It doesn't happen overnight. Obviously, we help clients through that with, with, our, with our folks to help them get up to speed. And then our job as consultants, too, is we, we, want, we want our clients to be self-sustainable. So we want them to um, grow and, and hire. And we've actually you know, interviewed for our clients on behalf of them to, to try to get them to hire good data architects and engineers and what have you. And of course, the implementation roadmap. How long is this thing going to take? What's going to be the cost of it? What am I in for? You know, and so we really try to get detailed past that current state, future state um, <clears throat> mindset there, and, and or those activities, and really try to lay out a phased approach, if you will, because no one, no one's ever just going to sign up for a, a big bang dollar amount and say, yeah, we'll get it done in in twelve months. We really got to like be agile about this, um, offer phases. Be flexible in that. Uh, businesses are growing. They're going through challenges right now. We, we rarely can a company just say, drop everything, let's go build this thing. Scott, how would you um, describe the right team in your mind? It's a good point, um, or a good question. So uh, I'll actually get to some examples here. All right, there you go. All right, uh, maybe tip number one. So I'll go through some sample deliverables here, and I'll try to talk fast here so I can get to some fun stuff with Elliot and Braden. But um, I just wanted to point this out. We have, if you go into those stakeholder interviews, these, uh, you know, we have some business, business questions, if you will, around, hey, like, what are your analysis requirements? How do you guys use data today? Um, what are some of your, your reports that you're looking at? Are you pulling things? What are you doing with it? Are you transforming it in Excel? Like, you want to try to uncover all the things that they're these business areas are doing today with data. Um, try to understand pain points and challenges. Uh, maybe what's working well. What's what do they need? Obviously, you're you're going to be asking business questions like what what are your metrics? How do you know you're being successful? How do you know you're failing? And so you want to get all all that out, out on the table. Um, one tip here. I know this is actually from the the data warehouse life cycle life cycle toolkit um, from from the Kimball team. Uh, so absolutely, you can. If you have that book, great. I think you can download this from their website as well. Uh, but this is just like, just basic questions, if you will, just to kind of prime things, right? So as you get into those conversations, you know, across the table from, from a business stakeholder, uh, of course, I'm not just gonna an ask all these questions uh, blatantly. Um, a lot of times you start, you start getting some of these questions going and the conversation flows and you start to ask the next, uh, the next question, you know, naturally, if you will. Generally in our stakeholder interviews, Hopefully, you know, they're not necessarily recorded, right? So if I'm, if I'm asking the questions, being the primary person to kind of make eye contact and talk through things and keep it going, it's nice to have like someone else on my team, hopefully taking notes in OneNote or what have you. So we can hopefully capture all those insights that we're, we're getting from, uh, from, from these leaders of companies, right? They have, their, their time is very valuable. So we're really trying to extract a lot of information out of them very quickly. Anyone read the, or I guess, does anyone have the kind of Kimball books? I know the dimensional modeling rights. Um, the life cycle toolkit is awesome for this stuff. A KPI definitions and prioritization. So think about after those interviews, we'll take, we'll start, we'll go back to our desks and, and really kind of look at what are those business questions that we heard from each group. We'll try to group those up by different themes, if you will. And those themes don't necessarily just uh, perfectly match and jive with departments, right? We kind of want to get out of the department um, or our categorization, right? Let's start to group these things up by themes, more like data themes. Um, 
And so we have these business questions. We try to understand and document what are the key metrics to answer those questions. Sometimes we don't know the hard questions to, to answer. And we try to talk about, or we try to identify what those benefits might be. Um, why do we do the benefits thing? That is kind of a hard piece at times, right? To articulate, I think we all know, yeah, it's gonna be beneficial, right? It's gonna be good. But we also wanna try to articulate it because we're actually gonna to try to help those trying to sell this project to know we need to modernize our data environments. Um, if we don't do it, there's gonna be big and big consequences or impact. On-prem SQL Server is, is full to the max and we have, you know, um, SLAs, right, that we need, to, we need to uphold. And so we need to help feed some of these benefits and the ROI out to the R stakeholders that are trying to sell this project and turn it to the C-level and get budget. So these are always good things to kind of um, crank through and make sure you articulate. Um, basically, try to get these major themes and what we're trying to do is Make sure, hey, which one should we go off after first? Has anyone kind of done an exercise like this? Like everyone wants everything now. Well, which group or which which kind of area of data or business should we actually go after first? So we, we try to we try to bring a science to it. Let's let's look at business impact. These are kind of things up here. Um, there's a whole kind of so we'll actually work with the stakeholders and ask and work with them on how they might rank and rate um, their needs based on business impact. And then we might talk with the data team and maybe IT to talk about technical feasibility. Like, hey, they're asking for this, but you guys don't even own that data. You don't even have access to it today. It's it at a third party and we don't even know if we can get the data. So that might be high, you know, or low technical feasibility, even though it might be high business impact. So when we kind of plot these things, these themes out here, well, we ultimately may recommend then going after the high, high feasibility, high business impact. First, not to say we're not going to do these other ones like um, ever. It's just like maybe we go after these first, low hanging fruit, um, high business impact, quick wins, and try to get get out there and get get some um, traction going. Well, just a, a comment on this one. I I really really love the scatter plot for helping business users understand like the value and the cost of implementation, right? Because sometimes it's it's more than just Hey, I need this data, but if you want to mash that data up with uh, data sources that you have to get from, uh, you know, DNB, and oh, it's a million dollar a year subscription. Well, okay, but are you going to get that kind of value from from that sourcing, right? And and helping business users really plot that out and see that can really help them in their decision making. Um, yeah. How do you determine the actual business value? Because so I try to have this customer with clients a lot, but they they have difficulty assigning an actual value to it. So how do you have any techniques or recommendations for like getting close to an actual meaningful value? Yeah, I mean that that's that's the kind of the work, if you will. Like so we we have a weighted kind of system, if you will, around business impact in these different these different areas. And so it can be, some of it can be us helping interpret where the business value might be. And so we're going to rank and rate those. We're going to give it a score and, but we'll do it with the customer, with that stakeholder. Um, and, and truly you kind of have to ask them to be honest too, because obviously everyone's going to rank their stuff high. Like, no, this is the most important thing in the organization. Please do my project first. So you really need to kind of make sure they're, um, yeah, you know, make sure that they're honest and, and, and kind of really kind of see through it. But yeah, we have a pretty, in-depth kind of scoring system is it perfect no but uh but it's we got to you got to do something i am partial to the fibonacci numbers right so just in the same way you 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 scope and estimate work scope and estimate what the value is to to your company you know is it something that is truly going to generate a trillion dollars in revenue great like then we can spend nearly infinite money on that if you're talking a hundred thousand maybe well, maybe we spend an afternoon or whatever, right? You know, so we balance that out. Yeah. Sorry for jumping in there. No, that's perfect. I appreciate it. And then, um, so another sample deliverable is the business dimensional model that we talked about earlier. And so you think about uh, up top here across is those are those metrics that we identified from the business questions. So we do interviews after the business questions, understand what those metrics are. 
And we try to group those metrics up by different themes, right? Then we also try to now intersect them with the, the dimensions. Um, that could be, you know, what has a time component to it? But uh, this was like for a credit union, right? So it does, is a branch involved. Also, that there's a lot of dot there. Um, there's members, there's employees, and so on and so forth. What you're trying to get through here is to understand where your conform dimensions might be and understand that uh, let's not create a, a member dimension uh, for, every, for every part that we do. Let's create that one member dimension and then reuse it across all your different facts, all the different events that are going on that, that score you know, performance for your, for your team or for your organization. That's kind of hard to do at times, right? To know, um, I mean, some of the easy ones are like, yeah, we got a customer, we got a date, right? Um, truly start to think about from a Kimball um, methodology, like what are some of the other dimensions to kind of, uh, what might you, you want to slice and dice your data by in a report later on to get, hopefully get an insight and an answer. Um, so some of those, really kind of do some thinking there, maybe scour some of the reports that you have today to help understand and identify what those dimensions might be. Um, and then that really kind of leads into the conceptual model, you know, like conceptual model to a logical model to a physical model. Um, so if you're a data analyst, a business analyst, and, you know, a lot of it starts here at the conceptual level and understanding, hey, these are all my conceptual facts here in the, in the middle. These are like our themes and our conformed or combined or uh, conformed dimensions are on the outside here. Yes, this was put, I put this together way back when in like Excel. Obviously, you know, who's, you, who's using other tools? Like I know I've been starting to use Lucid for conceptual designs. That's hugely helpful. Obviously, you can see the lines much clearer and where they're connecting. Um, obviously, Visio, Erwin, some of the, uh, what is it? Uh, SQL DB, that, um, that one's pretty good. Um, any others that people are using for kind of building diagrams or ERDs? Okay. Yeah, whatever it is, definitely use it and, and use it consistently. Um, punch those things out to PDFs, store them off in your wiki. Those are great reference points as well, too. Like um, I've had, if you're on a project long enough, right, uh, stakeholders will leave and come. And uh, so those are great artifacts, too, to kind of share with new people, incoming leaders at, at, at companies. Saying, like, hey, I heard you got this data warehouse. What's in it? It's like a big question, right? <laughs> so it, it's nice to kind of point back to data dictionaries or at least a diagram to give like them the that a thousand, you know, thirty thousand foot view of what what's accessible in the warehouse. Um, and then of course a conceptual solution design. We hem and haw and do all this every day, right, with our customers. We're like, what might work? What components in and out are going to work? But Components aside, a lot of times what we try to think about is what is the pattern of, of data movements um, that we want to set up here. And so, you know, this is just one of them, right? It may change over time based on based on methods that are that are popular or are evolving into, into being better than they were five or ten years ago. But if you think about, it, we want we need to adjust data, right? We need to connect to outside sources. It's not just connected to a SQL database anymore or, or an ERP. There's Tons of APIs and outside data that you guys are connecting to different formats, XML, JSON, what have you. Data's messy. You have to go after a whole bunch of different calls of APIs and then marry it up and shape it and make it business ready in your own environment. So we, we talk about ingestion a lot, right? Um, and then where are you going to store it? We know there you go. Fabric has been nice about this is obviously a couple years ago, right? So pre fabric. You can see like, hey, let's drop this data in Azure Data Lake Storage, ADLS. Let's potentially use Azure Synapse to build our build our facts and DIMs in our warehouse and our, and our and get our model out to either Power BI Premium and premium data sets or maybe leverage Azure Analysis Services. If you think about now what Fabric has brought together and kind of bringing all those pieces together in one environment and kind of one UI for a developer or an engineer or report designer, it's pretty amazing. So I'm super excited about the coming meetings here that where we'll actually dive more into Fabric and Power BI and really see the ins and outs. Uh, team roles. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all had to go through this, right? Like what, 
what is my optimal team to handle support maintenance of our data environments, new, new demand. So C levels are, are coming out with requests and I need this dashboard or scorecard and I feel like something's going on. Can you figure this out for me like tomorrow? And, uh, and so it's, it's good to have, uh, be very intentional about what team you're gonna need that's right size for, for your business needs. Uh, we talk a lot about, you don't have a, a data governance committee or a senior leadership team or something. We often talk about or recommend a data, some sort of data governance committee. Make sure that there's, you know, uh, uh, involvement from like a stakeholder from every business area that's helping them bring their input into what kind of the data team so that we can prioritize those needs, put a fill in the backlog if you run an agile, strong rights, and, and make sure that we can start keep the developer team going and cranking out value for, for the business. Um, who's running kind of a, a data team like this today? You know, uh, Scrum master and uh, a BA architect, engineer, something of that effect. Who's running sprints, like two week sprints or something like that? Grande, Grande Cheese, awesome. We put testing and QA. Is that in the hands of each team member? Or do you have you like a separate? Do you put your thumb? Yeah, we we definitely on some of our projects we'll, we'll definitely do like some testing, of course, and validation from uh, from a system testing and unit testing with our actual data team. Uh, please don't put that dimension out there if you know uh, kind of already it's wrong and that you you haven't really bettered it out. Um, yeah, you you did an insert and an upsert of, of data, and incremental loading, and what is the data right? So, so there's that level of testing, but then you know we we also a lot of times I'll have my uh, business analysts on our team who are out there in front uh, gathering the requirements and really distilling down what the story should be. But on the flip side, let's look at now after it's come the data is shaped and come out of the warehouse ready for end user consumption is it actually ready. Um, does it actually look good? Can we actually build those measures in DAX and have it sliced and diced by your by your uh, wanted dimensions? If that's not happening, then then we missed a step somewhere or missed a translation in what the users need. So I often like having usually that same person kind of advocate for the business, and then on the flip side, confirm if it if the data is actually correct from, a, from an end user standpoint. Um, easier said than done, right? I know everyone gets busy, but it's nice to have a dedicated business analyst or slash data analyst to really make sure that, that um, we kind of see it all the way through from end to end. Awesome. All right, last but not least, roadmap. Um, after all the conversations and all the solutioning and, and all of the figuring out what's important to your organization so that we can help you guys um, better manage the data and then so you can get to those metrics and KPIs. Let's build our roadmap. What is that going to look like from, from a timing and a cost standpoint? And um, where might you go? This is just like one example here. But again, we try to, try to do these things in phases. It really kind of depends on the appetite of our customers, like how fast do they want to move? Um, how urgent is their need for a better data and analytics program and environment uh, to stay competitive in the market, to move their business forward? Um, you know, having strong strong conviction from from those stakeholders who are kind of pushing this initiative kind of leads back to those benefits i talked about try to don't pass over those things don't just say we need it we need snowflake or we need azure or we need this or that right it's like why do you need that so that a lot of times that helps sell those projects i now snowflake i'm just kidding <laughs> This is, you're, you're talking about like a, a nine month project. Yeah. yeah. This is not just a small. Right. I mean, probably minimum is three months for to get anything done, if you will, like from from, um, from old world to new world. If, it, if there's a big overhaul of what you're, you know, setting up new architecture, um, getting your your your, te your patterns down for data flow and um, and making sure that you can get those models built uh, or data sets or data sets or semantic models built, you know, for for Power BI consumption. So, um, yeah, uh, a lot of times we'll we'll try to supplement and use our team at Baker Tilly to expedite and kind of um, accelerate that path to maturity on, on the analytics front for our customers. 
so we can get them up and running all the while we're doing like collaboration and training and knowledge transfer and handoff kind of usually along the way knowing like hey we've got we've got some people at, uh, uh, personnel at, at our customers who are pinned or pegged for like being able to take this stuff over once we get things set up awesome um, all right I will any questions for Scott before I kick it over to Elliot? All right. So think think data strategy. If you got if you're you know your leadership at companies or at your organizations, um, I don't know, ask them if you have one. <laughs> or I'm sure everyone has one, right? But is it well kind of articulated? Is it well defined? Uh, That's a great question. <laughs> Who here knows? Your company's data strategy. We have two hands, two hands up. What's your company's data strategy? Let's try to make it better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, all right. That, that's the strategy, yes? We really want to take data, turn it into information, knowledge, and ultimately wisdom to make better business decisions. That is an excellent data strategy. Well done. That, that, that's, that's what we want to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what you got. yeah. Anyone else? All right. I challenge. Ask your leaders what is your data strategy? If they can't do the same thing that Rob just did, challenge them to come up with that, right? Hey, by the way, so internally at Baker Tilly, we uh, we we run communities of practice. So that's a way for us outside of client work and projects, right, to get together internally as a team and share our passions and insights around different areas. One of them is data visualization that I lead. I know Chris and Marcus work on like our enterprise data modernization. So kind of like those like fabric kind of goes over both of those pieces. So we're high Thanks, Scott. And and uh, just to segue a bit, I think a part of that uh, data strategy that was mentioned in the audience there is um, making better decisions with data. And a part of that is the design process and having reports that effectively um, help users make better decisions. So um, hopefully we can walk through some of those concepts together here uh, together. Um, my name is Elliot Pack. I'm a manager with Baker Tilly. Um, calling in here from Denver. So thanks for uh, allowing me to crash the Madison party here. Um, I started my data career uh, working um, to help government contractors settle d disputes with uh, the federal government. Um, so a lot of data visualizations and explaining data in general um, between the government and these uh, government contractors. Since then, and more recently, I've been working with the Microsoft stack, um, Power BI, more recently Fabric, um, specialized in data modeling and visualization, um, really enjoying uh, you know, many aspects of the, the data world here. Um, outside of work, uh, as you can see from my pictures, I love getting out um, into the mountains of Colorado, um, rock climbing, mountain biking, all sorts of activities outdoors. Um, I also enjoy uh, photography and ceramics, and I think those kind of tie into my discussion here on uh, design best practices, um, and that's really why I enjoy it. So without further ado, I'll uh, we can just Go forward here. Awesome. So today I want to walk through getting from the left side of your screen. Uh, that's the blank canvas, the ominous add data to your report um, screen that you get when you open up Power BI um, to the right screen, which is a report that you can deliver to users and have them uh, answer questions about their data. 
what the process that we use with clients at Baker Tilly, I've used this for years, um, really takes your your client or your team um, through the scoping and planning stage that Scott uh, touched on um, with his part of the presentation through design, prototyping, testing, and then finally publishing and managing uh, reports out in um, an ecosystem uh, where your users can um, work with the, their data. Um, I'll go through each of these stages briefly, um, discuss some important objectives of each stage, and um, also touch on some con other considerations and, and tips, um, especially in the, the design stage here. So Scott really um, touched well on this, but before landing a report on a page, um, you really need to understand um, who will be using the report. So that's your audience. What do they need out of the report? Um, what are they trying to answer with the uh, within their data? Um, that's really important to understand their needs before you can um, start designing effective reports. So what does this involve? Uh, Scott touched on a few of these, but um, interviews, getting to know um, your audience, how, what granularity they want to see the data. Um, this may involve conducting interviews, shooting out surveys to your organization, um, it's really important to get uh, together in the same room or, or conversation with your audience um, to understand um, what they want to see out of the reports. Um, additionally, you'll want to understand the availability of data. It's great to have some um, you know, high hopes of an analysis that your organization may want to see, but if that data is either um, not available or expensive to um, capture, like Chris alluded to earlier, it may not be worth um, pursuing that data. So I, I want to um, make sure to touch on the connection between your audience and the reports that you design. Um, so when designing reports, you want to think about, um, is it an executive who's going to be uh, using this report? If so, it may um, lead you to create a high-level dashboard, a really macro um, view of the organization, um, or is it a information worker who needs to see granular data? Uh, they need to be able to filter down to the lowest level of sales on a particular day. Um, both scenarios are important to understand um, before you walk into designing uh, effective reports. So now the design stage. You understand um, what your audience wants and needs. Um, this is a stage where you can really throw your ideas at the wall, understand the pros and cons of each potential solution, um, brainstorm the, the possible. Scott often uses the, the art of the possible uh, as a phrase, and I think that it really, um, that's really what the design stage really needs to be. Um, I think often people limit uh, this stage to only um, the data that's right in front of them, um, but sometimes um, just throwing a, a new wireframe on the board and thinking of what could be possible, maybe not now, but five years down the road, um, can help at this this stage. So, um, what's how do we approach the design process? Um, I think conducting collaborative um, design sessions so you can get immediate feedback uh, with users. Um, you can leverage tools such as Figma, PowerPoint um, to wireframe out potential dashboards. Um, 
and I'll touch on a few of the, the best practices that I always like to keep in mind um, when designing these uh, wireframes and then later reports. Um, define UI requirements and plan a reporting theme. Uh, your organization may already have some, um, some documents out there on this, um, but if not, um, this may be a, the right time to uh, collect those requirements. Uh, and finally, plan your report navigation. Um, so it's important to think about how your users are going to interface with the reports. Um, when they open up Power BI, what are they going to see? Um, how will they get around from, from page to page? Um, all important things to understand at this stage. So I wanted to throw in here a couple of tips that I have um, for designing effective reports. Um, my tip number one here is effective KPIs. Um, so what is what are the components of a effective KPI? Often I see our clients throw a big number um, on the top of their report. There's no context. Um, there's no definition of why. Um, that number is important. Um, I think with the new uh, Power BI updates that have, we've uh, we've gotten in the past couple months, it's easier than ever to add um, meaning and context uh, below that headline number. Um, I think often uh, report designers forget that um, the the context of hey. You have hundred thousand dollars in sales this year in this category. Hey, is that good or bad? Um, is that better than last year? Um, or how are we trending in this category? Um, those are all important things to consider um, instead of just throwing a uh, a single number in a KPI. Along the same lines, a Framework that I like to keep in mind, um, I wish I invented this, but I didn't, um, is the 330-300 framework. Um, so the idea of this is when a user first looks at your report, um, within three seconds, they should be able to absorb uh, the meaning of your KPIs and targets. Within 30 seconds, they'll comprehend the details about your KPIs, so that was the context and meaning uh, that I illustrated in the last slide. And then within 300 seconds, so about five minutes, uh, they're able to dig into nitty gritty information within the report. Um, this is something that you can discuss with users as you begin testing, um, but um, as you're laying out your report, uh, one thing to keep in mind is um, putting your KPIs um, in the upper left of the report. That's a standard that we always suggest. Um, it's where um, your eyes often start out, um, and it will allow your users to better comprehend the um, meaning of your report within these uh, constraints. Next tip is on margins. Um, so we like to keep um, the left and the right equal. And then the top and bo bottom, there's a little more leeway. Um, often I see two thirds and one third on the bottom. Um, the reason for that is the way the human eye um, actually comprehends spacing uh, vertically. Uh, next time you go to a museum, check out the way that a piece of art or photography is framed. Uh, you may notice that the top third or the top uh, above the image or the bottom um, are not equal um, if you look really close, but uh, at first glance, it will look equal to you.
My next tip here is on uh, using color effectively. Um, it's a lot to say on this topic, um, but I think it really comes down to communicating the story that um, you want to uh, tell and um, bring your audience's attention um, to the right places on a report. Uh, one little tidbit on this, uh, I was talking to a front end developer the other day, and we were talking about how um, conventionally in the, the in the West, um, we see red as being uh, negative or declining. Um, although in many parts of Asia, um, red is a, a color used for increasing or positive. Um, so they actually had to um, change the coloring on their graphs, graphs uh, depending on the location where it was being viewed. So I thought that was an a, uh, interesting story to illustrate how knowing your audience um, connects to design and uh, designing effective uh, reports. Tip number five here is leveraging design tools. So I men mentioned this um, under the objective slide, but I wanted to highlight one tool that I've seen in the uh, kind of data community, UX community, um, a lot within the last year. Um, I've been using it more recently. I think it's uh, really great for wireframing um, collaboratively and um, and really quickly. So if I could grab the screen for a second, Chris, if that's all right. Yes. Awesome. So this is Figma. It's commonly used in the web design UX field. Um, I've been using it more recently for wireframing Power BI reports. Um, I created this package of different wireframes. Um, it's pretty simple and intuitive to use. Um, you're really dragging and dropping vectors uh, similar to if anyone has used Illustrator or Photoshop. Um, very intuitive to use, like I said, um, made all of these in a couple of hours. I love having conversations with clients and on the fly um, saying, hey, we just want one KPI on this report. Well, that's awesome. I can delete this, pull this around, snaps to place. Now we have um, one KPI there. Another cool feature of this is it's super collaborative. Um, I may seem like a loser here. I'm having a conversation with myself on, on Figma. Um, but if you have a team working here, um, you can comment on different areas of the wireframe say, hey, let's show trends in inventory with a bar graph in this area. Or, hey, I don't like the colors of that um, line graph you have started there. Let's change that up. Um, so it's cool how collaborative, live, multiple people can uh, work on the same page at the same time. Um, it's really it's really steps ahead of what you can do at the moment in uh, for uh, PowerPoint, for example, um, and I love working with it. I will mention at the end of the day, you have your wireframe ready. You can export this as a SVG and uh, bring it into uh, Power BI as a Canvas background. Um, gives you a head start on your report design. <clears throat> Elliot, I, I love that. We're starting to use Figma a bit more. If you're on LinkedIn and a lot of your posts are about Power BI, right? Um, you're probably seeing Figma um, referenced a whole bunch recently. So definitely check it out. I mean, I've been a PowerPoint person or a Snagit editor, and 
you know, other you know, kind of tools that are accessible to us usually. Um, Figma has been pretty fun to, to try to utilize for wireframing and mockups and such. All um, right, now we need to do another question because it's been a little while. Let's get some interaction here. Who here, uh, well, this is not for a t shirt, this is just for a poll of the room. Who here is using backgrounds inside of Power BI? Good. Who could tell us why you should use a background like this inside of Power BI instead of the native visual settings in Power BI? Performance. Now raise your hand. But Sorry. yes, that is. <laughs> that's what we'll explain. It cuts down on the number of visual objects that are loading on your pages. That is correct. Power BI, like everything in the, the uh, in the web these days, is is a, a JavaScript front end, so it's a singular or singular threaded processing painting of objects on your, on on the page. So you want to have as few objects as possible. That background will preload before any of the visuals or queries will start to hit your back end. So if you use Figma or PowerPoint or any other design tool out there to create a shape and structure to your report, you skip ahead of that and you don't put any weight or uh, performance impact on your loads. So uh, that could be especially impactful if you're working on like a report where you might wanna have hundreds of KPIs that you're displaying. If instead of having hundreds of visuals, you uh, do this for the background, and then you, you group those visuals together using the new like KPI uh, a visual. You can really cut down on the number of objects that are on your uh, page and really increase the performance. Yeah, all great points. You can really put a lot of information on your canvas before um, compressing it into an SVG and um, throwing it as a throwing it in as a Wallpaper. We all know design and aesthetics matter in BI and analytics and reporting. So definitely, just these types of techniques are getting easier and easier. You don't have to be a graphic artist to, to get there. So definitely, you want to look good to the report or the, the audience that you're building a report for and delivering it. Just make yourself look like a pro really quickly by utilizing some of those design tips. Thank you, Elliot. Um, yeah, I'll share my screen. I know you got a few more. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up here in the next few slides. Make sure Braden has some time here. Um, just wanted to touch on the prototype stage. Um, so this is after your wireframes are all set. You've got good design ideas. Um, this is the stage where you'll build real reports with real data. Um, you'll get buy-in from users. Um, you'll build out your navigation that you designed in the previous stage, your filtering, leverage drill down, drill through, tool, tool tips, um, and Make sure to use all those uh, best practices in design and uh, communicate those to your organization um, so that others who are creating reports follow those best practices. You guys use the term prototype when you're building out like that version one? Draft. Draft. <laughs> Draft. <laughs> Whatever the case is, right? It's like you need that, uh, hey, this isn't final, but we're going to get that that draft out to you or that version one, that prototype. Um, so that obviously it gives it gives you guys the ability to gain feedback um, and make sure you know your those the report audience isn't they don't have anxiety like, oh this is it. This is oh this is nothing like I wanted, right? So mm -hmm. you but you gotta get that version one out there, that draft and um, gain feedback. So yeah. The next stage is testing. So um, this is where you'll uh, release that prototype to the world, or at least a subset of the world, and um, have them test it, give you feedback, um, ensure that it is performant and accessible. Um, you'll 
collect feedback from users via interviews or surveys, and then go back to the drawing board as needed um, to improve your reporting. As Chris touched upon, or yeah, you, you asked me earlier about kind of testing strategies. Yes, we'll we'll test as a data team, right? Even the business analyst, but you do want early on want to identify who's who's that who's that stakeholder or that person that you're that could be a tester for you in the business. So when you're writing that story or you're getting you're getting requirements, think about like the acceptance criteria. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but you should have something in place. So hey, how do we know when done is done? Do we hit the target? Um, you know, and so is if uh, so and so on that team, you know, on the finance team is the one who's going to be like, yes, you, this is it, you got it. Then I'll, you know, you can mark it done, and then obviously iterations and enhancements beyond that um, are in the future that can be put into play. But um, identify those those people early and often. That that'll help you guys keep moving forward. And then finally, we have the publish and manage stage. So this is distributing it. Uh, to your organization, um, planning for everyone to hop on and start using these reports. Um, key things to check off here, configure your security settings. I know it's just a little checkbox there, but there's a lot that goes into that. Um, developing trainings so users are um, equipped to use your reports or design reports um, if that is the way your organization is set up. Um, monitor performance, so as you distribute to your whole organization and your scheduling refreshes of the data, is your performance uh, continuing to be optimal? Um, I'll say again, it's iterative, um, collect feedback, and continue to improve your designs, um, talk with your audience, uh, continue to understand their needs as they evolve. Um, like, like Scott mentioned, this is not a, a one and done process. Um, businesses change and so should reporting. So um, it's a never ending loop. You have to say before Chris joined Baker Tilly, I felt like I knew him already because I watched your video on YouTube about uh, going through the Power BI admin settings, and you went one one by one on all of those different check boxes, like what's default, what you might be concerned about, you should turn that off for security and, and other things like that. So, um, yeah, I think I was like on the treadmill in my basement watching your YouTube videos. So thank you, Chris. No one else has done it. <laughs> <laughs> We'll go look back and yeah, the one the one user, yeah. All right. The one viewer. Hey, thanks a lot, Elliot. I appreciate it. Probably snagging more time yet. Yeah. Last but not least, certainly. Um, Braden Gogan to talk through again his his kind of experience, his journey, his roadmap as a business analyst and as a consultant coming out of college and joining us here. Getting some valuable experience already. Kick it over to yeah, you. Thank you very much, Scott. So, as Scott mentioned, he thought it'd be nice to have me join tonight to talk a little bit about my experiences, um, particularly with my education, and hopefully it can apply to maybe somebody who's in the same path as I am, uh, looking to maybe have a career change or like a citizen developer. So if you're in marketing, for example, and want to explore solutions within your team within Power BI, uh, hopefully I can provide a little bit of clarity as far as what that may take to feel comfortable with going and developing those solutions. A um, little bit about me, uh, as you saw Elliot and Scott had there, who are my slides. Um, I am the oldest of three and I graduated in the spring of 2022 from University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I studied business information systems and data science. I joined Baker Tilly about a year ago now and have been staffed uh, working on a project with Scott for about nine months. And meanwhile, have uh, got certified in Azure Cloud Fundamentals, Data Fundamentals, and the Power BI uh, data analyst certification, which 
I'll talk about each a little bit as well. Uh, Scott, we can move on to the next slide. So here's like my general roadmap uh, working with data. So I'll hone in on the main, the middle three there that have icons. Uh, so 2020 is my first exposure working with BI, uh, working in a professional capacity with data. Um, and then I graduated in the spring of 2022, so two years ago almost. Um, and then began with Baker Tilly in 2023. Um, so I'll talk about on the next slide about my experience with Tableau, my introduction to working with data uh, in a professional capacity. So I worked on campus with the Division of Information Technology as a metrics and data analyst. And like Scott mentioned, uh, the roles of a B BA really identifying uh, different needs with different stakeholders is what I was doing in this role. Uh, little did I know at the time that the experiences I was developing then uh, would help me with a career in consulting where it actually paralleled quite a bit. I mean, we followed somewhat of an agile framework. Uh, however, it was at a significantly smaller scale. Um, so I was helping different stakeholders discuss the consequences of updating filters. Um, so things that are very basic in the realm of BI. Um, however, a lot of the stakeholders throughout campus, they just wanted to look at their reports and they weren't necessarily in um, involved with development of their reports. And then um, later my senior year, I was involved with actually developing the reports for different stakeholders. Um, following some of the techniques that Elliot discussed where uh, discussing different wireframes and different options as far as dashboard design and report layouts. And this was my first actual exposure to working with data, as I mentioned, uh, like in a professional capacity. And I was able to learn that this is something that I want to do and continue to do. And I think that I would encourage anybody like to they want to dabble with something to take something that's like uh, low stakes. And what I mean by that is like if you want to pursue a career or do a career change, go and shadow somebody, um, go to the Madison Fabric user group and connect with people who work with data and see if that's something that interests you. And I that's something that I definitely took away from this experience. Um, and yeah, I don't think I have anything more to add here, Scott, if we can move on then. And then I graduated from university uh, and my education was what I would describe as a business education with technical exposure, studying MIS. So what I mean by the technical exposure is I had exposure to different uh, subfields of IT, what's called IT, uh, working with data modeling, project management, and then programming, which I then uh, use the data programming curriculum to continue the sequences of courses to study uh, data science and then as well as web development. Um, my undergraduate education, it like all education, it wasn't necessarily um, very applied. It was a lot more on like the know how and understand things from an exposure level. Uh, however, uh, I wasn't necessarily working with different uh, projects that were hands on, um, which is how all education is. Uh, I think that uh, another takeaway would be like something that was deficient with my education was a cloud introduction. I don't know if other universities are providing this as an option. Uh, however, I know mine didn't at the time. I don't know if they developed one, uh, but I think that that'd be something that'd be really big for um like an introductory course uh even as an elective and go through like what is infrastructure as a service what is a platform as a service solution and go through the basics especially if you're graduating with management information systems as a uh, degree so then in january of 2023 i joined baker tilly and I was staffed on a project with Scott, for which I am currently as well. 
uh, working as a business analyst. As Scott went over, my main responsibilities are meeting with the different stakeholders and illustrating their current state, as well as the ideal future state for which they would like to be at when a business need is met. And this involves working with our development team, uh, maybe the development team of a third party or the client, and I, making sure that we have a clear understanding of what the business needs are and a clear understanding of what those business needs being met uh, will look like. Um, as Scott mentioned, like sometimes some of the things that sound simple um, maybe can be a little bit muddy, like what is us, what is satisfactorily meeting this business need? What does that look like? Um, points like that uh, can have uh, can be up for some contest and definitely some discussion points and making sure that that's all clear. Um, so to make sure that the business needs are all clear, uh, then I come in on the back end, as Scott mentioned, uh, like with what he tends to run, the engagements that he manages, the BA also business analyst tends to work with uh, quality assessment and making sure that the requirements are met. And so for me, that is involved working with Power BI a lot as a lot of the business needs have been in Power BI for our client. And to be able to feel prepared to do so, I started uh, in the middle top left there with uh, an Azure Cloud Fundamental Certification. Uh, I don't think that this certification really requires uh, much technical background. And for me, it did provide me a nice uh, introduction to the cloud. The Microsoft Learn modules were a good resource for this, and it filled in a deficiency that perhaps my formal education um, had. And then I continued with the cloud data fundamentals. Um, we tend to be a Microsoft oriented shop, um, specifically working with data, uh, although we are likely expanding to different solutions. Um, however, I wanted to make sure that I had a good fundamental uh, understanding of the cloud. And I think that this is a little bit of a broad um, certification path. However, it did provide me really good exposure to uh, what perhaps clients or uh, enterprises would be looking to use based on like their current infrastructure, whether it's on premise, uh, whether they have some like infrastructure as a service solutions, um, and then moving things into the cloud as far as data goes. And then more recently, I uh, pursued a Power BI certification for which I passed last month. And this one required some more studying and preparation. I think that this uh, I would say that this requires a few months of experience to uh, be confident and pass. I don't know if there's sufficient content available on the web um, to make up for maybe not having any experience. Uh, so I think that um, if you want to go ahead and pursue the certification, I think it's a good indicator that you have a working understanding of the capabilities of Power BI and managing Power BI. And then in the lower right there, I have some icons that will round out my presentation on the next slide. Hang on a second uh, before we switch. Uh, Brandon, uh, would you recommend this order of going through the certification, starting with cloud, then going to the data, and then going to specifically in Power BI, or would you switch this around? For me, I think that this was good. However, it definitely depends on who's taking the certifications. Uh, I think for somebody for our practice and what we do, I think that this is a good path. Um, getting the cloud fundamentals and understanding what the cloud provides. Now, perhaps somebody went to a different university if they're a campus hire and were able to get a formal education and what the cloud services are, then that certification is probably not for you. But in general, yes, Chris, I think this is a good path. And then Perhaps maybe somebody wants to go and do the DP203 and go towards the data engineering route as they look towards those intermediate level certifications or explore Fabric. DP600 is that? Yeah, that's right. Yes, alpha, alpha, beta, beta test for the DP600. Do we know when it's coming out of beta? No, it, it's basically as soon as we get enough data for 
how many people like failed the same questions so we know which questions to dump and how to like prorate that group yeah but like you literally like if you can take it today you won't even get your score until it actually until they release it sure so if you're wondering what month it would not be for a couple <laughs> <laughs> no i think I want to say when the DP 300 was first out and I took the beta of that, I think it was like a three to six month wait before I even found out what my score was on it. I'm, like, I'm going to guess you will get your score before we see fireworks on 4th of July. That's a guess. That's low inside information. <laughs> 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 All right, back to you, Brayden. <laughs> All right. Uh, so to round things out, for me, the most fundamental um, resource for working with data I, has been to refer back to the Kimball Data Warehouse Toolkit. Uh, however, this kind of is a metaphor for all the fundamentals, um, making sure that if you're working with data, that the fundamentals are important. Uh, I know for me, referring back to um, this has been useful, and Scott pulls it in a lot. Uh, it was a integral part of his slide, although it was a different resource from the Kimball group, it's the same methodology. Um, Scott's looking at it more from a project manager perspective. And um, this, if you're working with data modeling or project management, uh, I think that uh, it's necessary to follow some sort of framework. Like um, Chris went up 45 minutes ago or so and asked, uh, what is the data governance policy of your enterprise? And to have those things defined um, and fundamental, I think, are imperative to continue on and have a productive uh, team and individual work um, at whatever scale it may be. And then uh, personally, uh, developing a skill set has been more productive when I'm working on things opposed to studying for things like one of my goals for this year is to get exposure to AWS and the path that will be taken for that is uh, participation in the QuickSight competition rather than pursuing a certification. Um, QuickSight is Amazon's uh, Power BI competitor offering. So I'm looking forward to getting some exposure to that. And then lastly, um, to expand knowledge by watching Chris's videos and uh, watching Chris connect with the other uh, leading thinkers in the space and learning about all the great things that are being developed with Microsoft and with Fabric and as well as members in the community as well. I recommend if, if you're an Amazon Kindle person, get those Kimball books on, you know, electronically on, on Kindle. So that way you can search and bookmark and everything else as you're kind of looking through, you know, those, those big Kimball books, right? Like I, I, I know I have those on my desk at home somewhere. Hate carrying them around to client sites and work. So definitely uh, invest in the Kindle versions. I agree. <laughs> yes. Quick question, kind of going back to Elliot's or even anyone's perspective. What are your guys' take on presenting data in a dev environment or a production environment? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I have a strong belief that if you're doing data analytics work, you should only ever be working with full production data sets at the very least segment it down to a focused area because you need to be able to balance it out and make sure that it feels right as you work with the data. That's the best way to test out data as you're working with it, as you're shaping it, and as, you, as you're, you're playing with it. That's not the same for our app friends. They work with test dummy data all the time because they're working with inputted data. We're working on integrating data from all of our organization. So that would be my recommendation there. But when it comes to demoing data, that topic to me says potentially you're showing it to people who should not be able to see that information. And in that space, I think it's critically important that we have actual dummy data that we're uh, that we're working with that mimics the data that is uh, that we're reporting on. Uh, and I actually recommend it. There's a few strategies you can follow on that, but that's probably an entire like 
series of videos on right. how to come up with dummy debt. Does that <laughs> yeah. make sense? Yeah. Thanks for your take. No problem. Uh, and I, I would actually press you, like, if you have a security team that is saying, well, you can't have, uh, uh, like, production data in lower environments, uh, the federal government had issued that as a law, like in 2001, they had e an edict went out that they weren't allowed to do that if you were in banking, finance, healthcare, uh, or whatever. And uh, that, or, or it wasn't a law, it was a whatever regulation or whatnot. It's the only regulation I've ever heard of the federal government repealing, and they rolled it back six weeks later um, because they even they found out it was impossible to do and have good data. So. Um, when the federal government, uh, the U.S. at any rate, says eh, maybe we can't make that work, uh, then probably a good clue that you should probably not try that. So, yeah. Users, as you're doing your final testing and user acceptance testing, I work with a snapshot of production data that is not current, because the first thing they're going to do is grab this report that you're testing, compare it to the live system, and say. It's off by three pounds yesterday. Well, it doesn't have all the yesterday in it. I mean, there's a latency. You don't have a latency to tell me. This is a snapshot. It's as of two weeks ago. I'm a big fan of. Time in a prototype, and it just doesn't work. Yeah, as of end of last month, or as of uh, a defined date. Maybe you have a refresh schedule on that. Like, hey, you know what? On the first of every month, we'll pull in the last month and we'll refresh it so it's semi-current. But yeah, that's that's an excellent observation. And then you don't have to worry about balancing all the time, right? Like, oh, now we're out of balance for whatever legit production issue that could. Be. Yeah, the weekend came and there was a holiday. And yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah, good point. Try to keep your testers focused on usability of it. Are the metrics working? Can you slice and dice? Is it getting them what they what they need? Not necessarily on matching production to a snapshot. Yeah. Great question. Any other questions? Thanks, Scott, you want to advance your slide? Oh, oh. Can you refresh your page? Or stop sharing, close and reel. <laughs> Sorry, hang on one second. Late arriving data has impacted <laughs> our presentation here. Can you refresh this? Yeah. Okay. All right, but while we're doing that, uh, we are going to do a fabric question here. So, who can tell us what does our uh, uh, What's the difference between a lake house and a warehouse? Yes. The lake house can take in all types of data, like both structured and unstructured, where the warehouse is more like structured data. That is exactly right. Well done. There you go. All right. Um, all right, next question. Fabric question. In Microsoft Fabric, what does RTA stand for? That is right. Well done. Good job. Okay. Uh, boy. Uh, is it coming up? Yeah. Okay, no problem. What's that? Softballs. Softballs. Okay. Um, uh, when Microsoft Fabric was, uh, mm, no. That's a, these are softball questions. <laughs> How do you want to get more? Uh, uh, so, what languages, programming, or what uh, query languages or language can, languages can you use in Microsoft Fabric? Name three. Three query languages you can use in Microsoft Fabric. Animal. Yeah. R. Okay. Python. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Anyone have any others that they can use? Well, well there's stickers for this one. Come on, there's, a, there's, a, there's an obvious one. Come on. Everyone hates it. SQL. 
Uh, Dax? Yes, Dax is the other one. It's good to be All right, here we go. Thank you, sir. Good enough. Boy, that got right when that goes on. Holy cow. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, thank you guys, uh, Braden, uh, Scott, Elliot, thank you guys very much. Just a, a note. We are always looking for speakers. This, the, the user groups is a great place to come and present, to learn, but also to get, get good reps at getting up and speaking and presenting in front of an audience. So if you have anything you'd like to speak on, we would love to host you and help facilitate that uh, so that you can you can get there and share your knowledge and where it lives and insights. It does not have to be a full on you know, presentation. If you have an hour, great. If you don't, let us know. We'd happy to. We'd be happy to have you come along and just share some tips and tricks that you found. That would be wonderful. All right. Um, go ahead. Go to the next one. All right. Now uh, we did see the matrix chart out there. It is entirely possible for you to auto generate that that information so that you can document all of your Power BI data sets and data models out there. Uh, that is something that like we do all of the time for our clients. Please take a look at the DMVs that are available inside of Power BI uh, and, and uh, X, you know, the XMLA endpoints. You can do some incredible reporting on top of that. It's a great uh, alternative. All right, next one. Anyone using DAX Editor and querying out some of the metadata, right? A bit, yeah. Yeah, reach out if you guys need some query, some of those sample queries so we can get those to you. Yeah, there's, you can do a lot. All right, we did already mentioned we've got the next six months booked out. Next month is Shabnam. She's going to be uh, well, she's going to be online. She's going to be presenting about uh, an introduction to Lighthouse inside of Microsoft Fabric. So for those of you who did not know the answer to what's the difference between a data warehouse and a lake house, this is going to be a great one to come to. It's also going to be a good one to come to and check out what's latest and greatest in the lake house. Microsoft Fabric, for those of you who don't know, they release two updates every single week to the service. New features are being added in all the time. And they only release the documentation once a month. So like, uh, <laughs> and, and not everything that gets updated makes it into that documentation. You'll find some stuff in there where everyone's well, like, where did this come out? Um, so this is going to be an excellent uh, session. Please make sure that you join us for that one. Uh, following that, we've got James, Sarah, and we've got Alex, Rustin, and Gaston Cruz, uh, PowerMates. Uh, they're going to be coming and they're going to be presenting as well. So pretty excited to have them. Uh, go ahead next. Tomorrow, if you are an admin or you have an admin uh, inside your organization, make sure you join my live stream tomorrow. I've got Bogdan Blagda. He is the owner of the Fabric admin capacities and, and the reporting metrics and uh, all of those capabilities. He, he's going to be the guy who, if you want to ring someone's neck about like the lack of features or questions and stuff, he's the guy who's going to be on my live stream. We're going to be talking through this. Uh, he, he's a real sharp, nice guy, so it, it'll be a good conversation. Please. What please. time is that? I can't. That's at noon central. So uh, every Wednesday I do a lunch and learn um, at noon, so please tune in for that. I got a whole lineup for a couple months I'll set up there. On Friday, we've got the SQL Gene. He's going to be going through, he's going to be showing, he's got a new program on why is your SQL slow. He's going to be running through that, so this is pretty good. Uh, do check that one out. And then tomorrow I also am immediately following this live stream. Uh, I am hopping on a call where we're doing a deep dive uh, at scale, did a comprehensive study uh, measuring the, the performance of Power BI with direct or Fabric with Direct Lake against Snowflake. Uh, it's a pretty good study. I got a preview of it. He did uh, spend a lot of time documenting it, going through and showing this. Can't wait to have this conversation. You should definitely check it out. It's going to be a big one. I think I heard there's over 3,000 people that are signed up for that one. So that'll be a big one for tomorrow. Go ahead, next. Big conference-wise, there's a number of things that are coming up. SQL Bits. Um, so if anyone's looking for an excuse to go over to Europe, 
This is a fantastic reason to go to Europe <laughs> on your company's time. Um, it is a great session. It is in March, um, to the start of March, and then MV, or wait, MVP Summit, SQL Bits, and then Microsoft Fabric occurs, uh, the Fabric User Conference. If you don't want to go to Europe and you want to go to Las Vegas, uh, I'm going to Vegas. Uh, Marcus, you're going to Vegas, right? I'll be in Vegas. All right. Uh, if you could go to Vegas, this is a great time. I'm going to be speaking at, at the events. Um, uh, so please join us in Vegas. This is going to be a little crazy, so it's a good one to go to if you're <laughs> uh, uh, at, at all of uh, that kind of mind. Um, but also SQL Atlanta is coming up too. There's a ton of people going to the SQL Atlanta thing. Um, so if you have any interest, uh, please do check that one out as well. Uh, so if you're, what is it? It's just one day. It's a Saturday, yeah, it's a Saturday, um, it's April, oh, April 20th. Oh, it's my wedding anniversary. Uh, I will not be going to that. <laughs> uh, I was at the MVP summit for my wedding anniversary last time and my wife still reminds me. <laughs> All right, and with that, Thank you guys very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Well, will actually, you guys have a great day. Peace out. Bye. Baker Tilly Digital combines strategic industry insight and advanced technical expertise to uncover and solve your digital transformation challenges. If you're interested in learning more, check out our website at bakertilly.com slash digital.